That's actually what my talk is going to be about. Just 45 minutes of me trying to throw an airplane. Let's get started. Welcome back to the uh, 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 center for uh, the last uh, lunch time talk of the week. Let me remind you that uh, when you leave or during the break, I'd like you to put your name on the sign in sheet for contact tracing purposes. If I know you, just put your name. If I don't know you in the cubicle, I don't know here, write your name and your email so that I can reach out to the uh, the COVID outbreak in this room. That's probably good. Um, I don't mind you anyway. Uh, there is no lunchtime talk next week, so there's no talk on Tuesday. And on Friday, there is no lunchtime talk, but we have the annual lecture series talk, the first one of the year, which was postponed from last year. Uh, Liz Westerwood, who is a professor of economics at Peach, is a star in behavioral economics, will be giving uh, the first uh, annual lecture series talk at the center, at, no, sorry, on the 10th floor. Um, so not in this room, but in the main room on the 10th floor. And um, it's at 3.30 p.m. From 3.30 to 5.30 and not from noon to 1.30. So this afternoon, 3.30 p.m. next week on Friday. And the talk uh, is going to be about gender differences in past communications, uh, cause and effect. So you're all invited to uh, join us for Lisa's uh, uh, talk next uh, week. And today it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Greg uh, Callan. He got his PhD from uh, Princeton a couple, of, a couple of years ago with uh, Tom Kelly. And the title of the dissertation was Rationality, Bias, and Mind Essays on Epistemology and Cognitive Science. It just tells you what are the, the main interests, uh, and the main research interests of uh, Greg, which are issues at the intersection of epistemology philosophy of science and uh, cognitive science. For now two years, he's been a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Department of History and Philosophy of Science, working with um, uh, Colin Allen, who is uh, uh, right here on a project connected to uh, AI. Um, and today, uh, Bryce going to be talking to us about, oh, and he's published actually you know, many papers on the type of issues I've mentioned earlier, uh, a recent one on the Australasian Journal of uh, Philosophy on rationality uh, and implicit, implicit so, so that we can have some interest in as well. So in today, uh, Brian will be talking about human achievement and artificial intelligence. Right. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, anyone who's watching on Zoom, uh, thanks for coming as well. And uh, just a sort of mea culpa to begin with. I haven't been in a room talking to people about philosophy that wasn't a Zoom room since like December 2019. So this is probably going to be bad. Um, in fact, Colin made sure to tell me this morning that I needed to say this work is my own work. Uh, this is not related to. <laughs> the project that I work on with him. <laughs> so, you know, take that or leave it. Um, but it's nice, nice to be sort of starting out doing some more in-person stuff with this kind of audience, um, because it's very different than the kind of audience that I had when I was in graduate school. And I'm gonna just try out some ideas. So really, I don't have any settled views in this area. I've just been thinking about some things. There's some things that keep me up at night. I'd be very interested in what other people uh, uh, what other people's views are um, in the Q&A. But I'm going to start with the what I'm going to call Seydal's Lament, sort of a case to set us up in thinking how about the types of cases that I want to think about. So this is a very sort of famous recent case in the advancement of artificial intelligence technologies, specifically deep learning and other kinds of algorithmic technologies. And this is uh, in March 2016, Google's DeepMind, uh, they produced this algorithm, they call it AlphaGo, uh, and they had it play this, this series of showcase matches against uh, Lee Sedol, who's this nine Don Go grandmaster, widely considered to be one of the greatest Go players of all time. And Sedol was only able to nick a single game out of this series. It lost four to one in a best of five match. And this was trumpeted, I mean, admittedly by some people who have a financial interest in this being true, this was trumpeted as a real breakthrough in the science of artificial intelligence. Um, comparing this, for instance, with the, uh, the 
networks that beat uh, Gary Kasparov and other kinds of the chess engines that were created in the late 90s. It was both thought that Go was a much more complex game than chess, so it's, it was significantly more impressive that a algorithm was able to beat a human being. And also it was sort of thought, I mean, people make predictions all the time about what AI can't do. And, uh, you know, those don't often go all that well. This was one of these, you know, Go is so complicated. It's so intuitive. It's so strategic. It's almost aesthetic in its play. AI is never gonna be able to beat human beings, you know, but chalk one up for the robot overlords. Uh, but I wanna look at this from a, from a slightly different angle than it tends to be looked at in the literature. There's a, a lot of really interesting and very sophisticated work, mostly having to do with, um, for instance, Cameron Buckner's work on cognitive architecture and the architectures of deep learning networks and how they compare with the connectionist models from the 1980s and whether or not there's something new about these new kinds of architectures that has immediate upshots for whether or not AlphaGo should be considered intelligent, whether or not its capacity should be considered rational. And whether or not, uh, in Mar Marta Helena's work, whether or not its play should be considered intelligent, whether or not it can be considered creative, whether or not it can be considered insightful. All of these are sort of great questions that are currently being asked, but I'm gonna ask a different question. And I'm gonna sort of focus, focus on poor Lee Sedol for a moment, who a couple of years after the match retired from professional go, probably partially for political reasons, not all having to do with existential dread, but some of it was existential dread. So he gave this interview where he said a quote that I think has resonated with a lot of people, which is with the debut of AI and Go games, I've realized I'm not at the top, even if I become number one through frantic efforts. Even if I become the number one, there is an entity that cannot be defeated, namely AlphaGo. And I think that this quotation, there's a lot of people who have somewhat similar thoughts about roughly the kinds of valuable activities and valuable outcomes that might be lost in a future where things that used to be primarily the um, purview of human achievers, you know, of expert human skill, the refinement of human talent being taken over by AI technologies. So it seems like a threat to the loss of value and the threat to a loss of value of a certain kind, kind that I'm particularly interested in the value of human achievement. So this is a, this is probably, this formulation gets a little bit more play in the, the, the popular press about this stuff than it does in the published literature. But this is a quote from uh, Oswin Pranov's writing in Forbes right after the announcement of Lee Sedol's retirement. He says, Sedol's final blow in professional go signals a more significant existential concern. If a world champion floating at the peak of personal achievement starts to view human accomplishment and machine accomplishment as one and the same, it creates an environment of frustration, disappointment, and perceived loss of purpose. Say it all, sits at the edge of this realization, but all of us are not far behind. And so I think that this is, you know, touching a nerve of some kind, and it's particularly touching a nerve having to do with issues of achievement, accomplishment, these kinds of valuable uh, perfections of human capacities that, you know, people tend to, it, to do a lot, tend to invest a lot of resources in and tend to think are valuable seems like it's under threat from superhuman AI technologies. So I wanna take Sadal's lament seriously. So I wanna ask, does superhuman performance of AI threaten the value of human achievement? And if it does, how best can we understand this threat? And I wanna take it seriously, both because it's just something that's independently interesting for me, but also because it offers a, a rare opportunity to do something that a lot of people claim that they want to have done in the various literatures that intersect with ethical issues in AI. Namely that uh, you can sort of tie together recent discussions and technology ethics around AI performance and value with a parallel and recently rather exploding development of a subfield within normative ethical reflection on the nature and value of achievement. So not only does this strike me as a case that's interesting to think about, but it also strikes me as a particularly uh, fervent area that we could be investigating the intersection between an applied and a normative ethical field. I'm also happy because I get to talk about being the greatest of all time and just keep calling it the GOAT, which I've never been able to do in a professional philosophy talk before. So I'm very happy about that. But I want to start with this, you know, jokes aside, because I think that this is the most natural formulation of Lee Sedol's lament and also one that I think ends up being one of the weakest. So I'm gonna start here. 
So I want to return to the, the actual content of the quote itself. So with the debut of AI and Go Games, I'm realized I'm not at the top, even if I become number one through frantic efforts as an entity that cannot be defeated. Becoming number one at the top, this suggests that Lee Sedol is thinking about a particular kind of accomplishment, a kind of accomplishment having to do with not just being pretty good at something, not just refining your skills to a certain capacity, but being really great at it, perhaps even being the GOAT, the best of all time, the greatest of all time. So the question is, is there some distinctive achievement of being the best in some domain? And secondary question, does the advent of AlphaGo threaten the ability for human beings to be considered the best in some domain? Now to get that, I just want to get, this is going to be way too quick for anyone who actually knows this literature, I just want to get some very basic metaphysics and value theory of achievement on the table, while noting that there's a lot of um, really sort of subtle debates that are currently ongoing. I just want to get uh, Gwen Bradford's very influential view from her book, Achievement, on the table. Just so we have something to work with. We can sort of modify the parts as we go along if we disagree with them, but this is, this is a view that's very been taken very seriously recently. So achievements are supposed to be agent involving processes that culminate in some product where both the process and the product are difficult and competently caused. You know, that there's like four different conditions going on there. What the idea is that think about these, the, the standard types of examples you might think of for like an achievement. I guess the, the most stereotypical example is climbing Mount Everest, right? What makes climbing Mount Everest an achievement? Well, it's not merely the goat getting oneself up the mountain because you could just take a car and then you could say you climbed Mount Everest, which I guess in a certain sense you did. And it's not merely getting to the top of the mountain because what's the point of just getting to the top of the mountain in and of itself? You're standing there thinking, okay, great. I'm at the top of a mountain. Why did I do this? Um, it's a combination of the process that gets you to a particular endpoint. And though that combination of process and product is difficult, it takes a significant amount of work for the agent involved and competently caused. And actually the competent causation condition is really hard. And a lot of people disagree about what that should be. Gwen thinks it just needs to be, you have a bunch of justified true beliefs about what you did. Um, some people think that you actually, your skills and competencies and abilities have to actually have caused in the right, with the right sort of causal connection, the thing in question. But this is sort of, these are all of these examples of, you know, climbing a mountain, playing Go at a high level, making a sort of breakthrough scientific discovery or playing a complicated violin concerto. Standard examples of, of achievements all seem to fit the very basic sort of picture that Bradford puts up. And furthermore, this, is, I, I, this isn't just a metaphysics talk. Furthermore, it seems like achievements can have a distinctive kind of value. Now in, in an older version of this literature, people were primarily interested in the welfare value of achievement. So how can someone achieving something be good for them over and above the product or the process in isolation? What is it, what is it about becoming a, a, a virtuoso piano player? that is good for the agent themselves rather than just good for the world for having all of their uh, beautiful recordings or whatever. But the more basic point and the point that's sort of been more discussed recently is just the intrinsic or final value of achievement. So it seems like there are certain things, certain achievements that just are rational to pursue because they're valuable. And this is typically though, I don't think, we, we can talk about this in Q and don't think it has to be given this gloss. I think it's typically given a perfectionist gloss. So the perfectionist thinks that the refinement of distinctively human capabilities is an intrinsically valuable activity. And um, in virtue of the difficulty and competent causation involved in achievement, achievements will involve the refinement of either human rational capacities to think or human rational capacities to act. That will just, uh, that, that will produce something of intrinsic value. Or if you don't like the human thing, it could just be like any agent more broadly, it doesn't have to be human beings. I'm not going to talk about, there's a whole bunch of value theoretic problems that we could talk about here. Um, one of the ones that usually comes up, for instance, is that uh, certain kinds of achievements might be relative. So not to throw Colin on the bus here again, but uh, relative achievements. So for me, giving this muddled, kind of confused, meandering talk might be a genuine achievement, whereas it might get Colin boot out of the room. Um, that's not the kind of case that we're thinking about, though. We're trying to sort of think of things that where everyone will agree it's an achievement for most human beings to get to that point. But there, there's a lot of difficulties and, and subtleties there 
that I would love to talk about and very interested in it, but I kind of want to get to the cases. So I'm just going to set those aside. So this allows for our sort of first reading of late Sadal's Lament, what I call the, the greatest of all time, the goat reading. There is a distinctive achievement value in being the greatest of all time in some domain. The, in, the invention of AlphaGo means that a human being will never again be the greatest of all time at Go. And this is a significant loss of value, maybe significant enough that it can license depression at the existential condition of the human being. <laughs> Um, and while I, I, I have sort of already flagged that this version of the lament, I don't find particularly plausible. I do think that there's an initial plausibility and, and it just comes from sort of seeing that like being the greatest Go player of all time, that seems like a more valuable thing than merely being a good or great Go player. It seems like that is a higher achievement than just the achievement of being pretty good at what you're doing. That's If you're being pretty good at what you're doing is an achievement, being the best is even more of an achievement. Why wouldn't that matter, right? But I actually don't think this can justify Sadal's lament for a couple of interacting reasons. The first one is that even if one happens to be the greatest of all time, I find it kind of implausible that there's very much value, if any value at all, merely in that, in that sort of honorific that you get over and above the value of the underlying achievements itself. I think you can see this at both the lower extreme and the higher extreme. So at the lower extreme, Imagine there are five people who only, there are only five people in the world who ever play Go, have ever played Go, will ever play Go, and they're all crap at it. They just are all really bad Go players. But one of them is slightly less crap than all the other ones, right? That, that agent is, is the greatest of all time in this possible world at Go. Question, does being the greatest of all time really add all that much compared to the fact that, you know, they barely even know all the rules and can't play on the full board, have to play on the nine by nine sort of kids board? I'm not sure. If it does, I'm, I'm willing to admit that maybe it does, but if it does, that overall honorific value really doesn't mean all that much. Really what's going on is that the reason why we don't think of that as a genuine achievement is because of the underlying facts about how good or bad somebody is at something. Not about the mere fact that they happen to be comparatively the best relative to some comparison class. And similarly, I think you can see this at the high threshold too. You know, imagine two really, really good Go players playing 100 games of Go, one of whom wins like 55 to 45. So like they win by enough that you think it wasn't just a fluke, they're slightly better than the other one. But really these are just like the best 100 games of Go anyone's ever played. It's gonna be studied for centuries. You know, people wax lyrically on the internet about how beautiful these games were, right? How much value should be assigned to the first player who won the 55 games and that achievement over and above the, the achievement of the person who won 45 games? Again, maybe some, but not very much. What matters is the underlying value of the achievement itself, not the honorific that happens to come from a, some comparison class. And that's going to be a, an underlying theme when we consider other versions of this reading that like, if AI can help us get better at doing things we find valuable, it's really unclear whether or not we should really care about the fact that the AI can do it better than we can. It's also unclear whether AlphaGo achieves, achieves anything at all in its play. So recall the sort of conditions we were talking about for achievement. Is it difficult for AlphaGo to play Go? It's not obvious. AlphaGo can play thousands, especially Alpha Zero, the version that can play games against itself to learn. It can play thousands of games of Go in the time it would take a human player to play a couple, right? In fact, it seems like that's the only thing in the world that it's designed for. If it's, if anything, it's the easiest thing in the world for AlphaGo to play Go. It's the hardest thing in the world for it to do literally anything else. So it's not clear that it meets the difficulty condition. Additionally, if you think that competent causation involves agential capacities and you don't think that AlphaGo is an agent, then it's not going to be competently caused in the right sort of way. So this is where the, does a fighter jet, does the existence of a fighter jet threaten the value of being the fastest human sprinter? What is the relevant comparison class for these kinds of GOAT considerations? If, it's, if these technologies are non-agential, it just doesn't seem plausible that the technology should be entered into the comparison class to begin with. And so it's really unclear whether or not that's a real threat to value. So this is, this is why I don't, even if, I'm, I'm willing to concede for, for the record that there might be some, I mean, one view is just that there is no value being the greatest of all time in and of itself. There's just value in the underlying achievements. Another view is that there's some value in being the greatest of all time, 
that in the in a given comparison class, but it's rather small. And the third view is that there's a significant amount of value. I'm only rejecting that third view, and I think both the first and the second one could be true, but they also don't justify the kinds of worries that we started this talk with. So it's time to look somewhere else to try to, to, try to get this, this worry off the ground. Um, the formatting on this slide when I turned it into a PowerPoint is atrocious, I apologize for that. Um, but let's try a different tact. It's it's not obviously Seidalian. It doesn't. It's not obviously what Lee Seidal was thinking. But it is something that has come up in some of the literature on this that discusses achievement in AI contexts. So remember, for Bradford and for others, what makes an achievement uh, valuable is its difficulty. Um, so what makes it the case that playing Go at a high level, or what makes it the case of discovering some new molecular process in the biology laboratory? What makes it a case that those things are achievements is that not just anyone can walk in off the street and do them. It takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of refinement. It takes a lot of effort. And again, for them, this is tied to perfectionism. Specifically for Bradford, it's tied to the idea that achievements are ex expressions of human rational capacities. And the refinements of those capacities have value. Now, here's a possibility, a slightly different possibility. The prevalence of superhuman performing AI could make things that we now consider achievements too easy for them to really count as achievements. And because they won't count as achievements, they'll sort of lose their value as a result. And this idea has been taken up by a couple of people in the literature. Uh, Danaher and Nyholm, for instance, are interested in automation of work. And they think that people often achieve valuable things in their workplace and that the um, displacement of work with the in the era of AI will make it so people have less avenues for that kind of achievement. Wang, in a for, or it's not forthcoming anymore, a very recent paper is interested in the, this connection with uh, cognitive enhancement and the idea that AI tutoring and AI aid and maybe even you know implanting chips in like the far future, but that's more of a sci-fi example. But this will make things too easy for us. We won't really have to overcome a lot in order to think way harder or way better than we already do. And they're going to lose their achievement value as a result. So instead, we could try to go for something like this easy reading. So the easy reading says, with the advent of superhuman performing AI technologies, this will cause, through whatever causal mechanism, human actions, which in the absence of those technologies, would be considered valuable achievements to become too easy to count as genuine achievements in a given domain. And here we're specifically thinking about um, not AI competing with human beings, but AI assisting human beings in doing things, right? So maybe once we, we have uh, continued access to AI tutoring or AI implants or whatever, playing Go might be as easy as playing tic-tac-toe. And there's not going, people, I mean, maybe actually there is competitive tic-tac-toe, I don't know, but. <laughs> I mean, human beings are weird, but like we can just assume, sorry, competitive tic-tac-toe players, there's not a lot of value in competitive tic-tac-toe, right? Um, so this is, this, is, this is an idea that people influenced by sort of the Bradford perfectionist readings on the value of achievement have thought that there might be a real threat here from, from the uh, advances of superhuman performing AI technologies. But as may have become clear because of where I've been going with this whole talk, there are some problems with the easy reading. Now, one of them is just a problem sort of a focus of scale. So why think human beings are at ceiling in some, in most domains, right? Why think that what's gonna happen is that these domains are just going to become easy and people will not see the value in achieving those things anymore? Why not think that instead, what we now consider a high level achievement will look to be kind of easy in the future, but something else, sort of higher up on the difficulty scale is what we're going to uh, fixate on in the future, right? And there's an interesting comparison here. I'm gonna sort of start shifting towards talking about other, other achievements other than Go to show how these worries are sort of applied to more than just competitive sport-like achievements, especially in the last section. But sort of the last thing I wanna say about the games cases is that there's an, a very interesting comparison with chess. So unlike Go, chess has been dominated by uh, AI technologies, chess engines for the better part of 20 years now. So you might think you just look to chess, you see where, where a lot of other competitive domains are going. 
And the, the results are really complicated. I mean, there are, you can find, if you Google things, I read an article this morning that was like, AI has ruined chess, now it's trying to save it or something like that. There's very conflicting ideas going on here. But actually, um, it's not the case that people have stopped trying to perfect their human capacities for chess, even though literally when you log on to chess.com, you have that little engine on the side telling you how terrible everything you're doing is, right? <laughs> I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't actually stopped people from playing chess. In fact, one very interesting upshot is that people have just been sort of shifting away from being so interested in the traditional multi-hour long games of chess that often end in draws and new variants of the game have sort of been becoming more popular. And by some estimates, when you include bullet and speed chess, like, you know, chess has never been more popular than it is right now. And now, in fact, I'm not going to really defend this, but in fact, if I were to put on my techno optimist hat, I would do it right here. So if anything, this represents a positive argument in favor of developing AI technologies. Because essentially what we can do is improve human capacities, make the things that we achieve even more valuable, and modulo a whole bunch of concerns we're gonna get to in the next section, it doesn't seem like it has a downside unless human beings are already at ceiling. It's implausible that that's true for most things that human beings do. Um, but also, I mean, just as a, a purely philosophical point too, it's also kind of implausible. I've been recently convinced that it's really implausible to think that difficulty is the only thing that generates valuable achievement. And Sakaina Herji has this really excellent case that I just think is sort of incontrovertible where she considers two Elizabethan poets, a brother and a sister, both of whom want to be poets in Elizabethan England. And the brother in virtue of living in a sexist patriarchal society is able to you know, get plenty of resources, get all the right sort of training, hook up with the publishers in London, you know, becomes a very successful poet, creates po poetry of a lot of value. Now the sister by the exact same causal mechanism is saddled with all of this domestic labor, assumed domestic labor and lack of access to all the networks that would produce, uh, that she'd be able to produce poetry from. And in this version of the case, just assume, it's significantly more difficult for her than her brother, who's just breezing through all the relevant channels. But she also, in virtue of this, this is probably the normal case, doesn't produce poetry that has as much aesthetic value. And you know, everyone can sort of see the ways in which it's not as good as what her brother has produced. Now, by the pure sort of Bradford account, we should say that the sisters' poetry has more value, even though it has less aesthetic value, it has more achievement value. But Sakana points out, and I think this is right, it doesn't seem like that really captures what is necessarily wrong about the patriarchal sexist society that blocks the sister's poetry from becoming very good. There's specifically because the sister is given unnecessary difficulties that do not contribute to the value of the achievement, but it just makes the achievement harder. That is That literally partially explains why the poem is so the, the, the achievement is less good and the sexism is bad. It's the unnecessary difficulties of developing one's talent is part of the wrongs of the sexist society. So there's a di distinction Sakena wants to say between the sort of necessary and unnecessary difficulties. And we, so then you really, it really isn't the case that mere difficulty is what really develops the value of achievement, which causes problems for these, for these easy readings as well. That sort of takes us way down the, the sort of value theory rabbit hole. And I want to, I, I would love to talk about that more in Q&A. But instead, I want to switch focus to, you know, I didn't really like the goat reading. I didn't really like the easy reading. Here are some versions of the worry that I have a little bit more trouble with. So one way you might have heard the easy reading is actually what I'm going to call the displacement reading. And this, I think, has a little bit more bite to it. So the displacement reading says that the advent of superhuman performing AI technologies will cause through whatever causal mechanism, human actors to fail to engage in achievement worthy activities at all in a given domain. So this is going to either through like justified rational reasons or sort of unjustified but psychologically potent reasons like feeling like Lee said all the way, it doesn't really matter the exact mechanism. But there are going to be some fields where the success of AI technologies will just cause human beings to believe there's no point in engaging in those fields anymore. And these might be fields where there is some genuine achievement value to be uh, had, but there isn't enough practical value when practically you can just go to the computer and get an example for there to be the types of support and resource structures that you need to really achieve great things. So one really interesting example of this will be what will become 
of protein folding experts in, in the next five to 10 years. So relatively recently, and this is still not like, you know, fully, this doesn't, still doesn't fully check out, but the, the murmuring is that another deep mind algorithm, AlphaFold, is becoming better and better at predicting merely from amino acid sequence structures what a particular protein fold is going to look like. Up until the advent of that, it was significantly like a significant decades long challenge for a molecular biologist to learn all of these non deductive complex strategic rules for guessing how a protein structure would fold given its amino acid sequence. And you might think there's a real significant value in, in learning those rules as a human being. And that might even be true in the era of AlphaFold, but if AlphaFold becomes widely available and nobody wants to support the time it takes for you to learn those rules and, and to, to develop that experience, it seems likely that people just won't learn protein folding rules anymore and they'll just use the, the available algorithms, right? So this kind of displaces, and this might be a way actually of hearing the, the Danaher and Nyholm sort of worry. Human beings are just being taken out of areas where they could be doing things of genuine, achievement value because more and more of it is being automated. That I think is a worry that I genuinely want to struggle with. And in particular, so that's more on the like intrinsic or sort of more philosophical. end. I actually think that there's a very more localized practical version of the displacement reading that's basically already going on and that I really worry about. And it starts with the fact that, you know, all this achievement talk, especially when we've been doing it in this perfectionist guys, can kind of seem a little bit elitist. I mean, you know, talking about playing a violin concerto as like a, one of the main things you can do as a sort of value. I mean, that's, you know, it has, it has this language of elitism sort of built into it, whether by design, you know, Tom Nagel thinking that the perfectionist should be okay with more talented people having more resources than less talented people or just in terms of like the, the relevant associations. I actually think you don't need to be a non-egalitarian to be a perfectionist, but the, the point I wanna make is more localized in societies like ours and resource unequal societies where some people have more wealth than others, achievements are just not justly distributed, right? And this comes down to the fact that achievements are difficult. Achievements are things that take time and training in order for you to develop the skills needed to do them. So those means in free time, can take on all the required training and effort, can go to the best grad schools, can publish in the best journals. And those without the same amount of uh, time to develop those skills just can't. And that, you know, that, that has nothing to do with AI in and of itself. It's just sort of a fact about unjustly or unequally resource distributed societies. But how does AI interact with that? Well, we know already sort of from the way things have been currently going that in general, at least right now, unreflective use of AI technologies has been sort of exacerbating inequalities in various sorts of ways. For instance, the uses of, of algorithmically biased uh, algorithms has been um, entrenching and in some ways even perpetuating beyond human understanding the biases inherent in data sets against, you know, various members of minority groups. And, you know, <laughs> All these so-called autonomous technologies require people to code and enter data and produce these big databases that are often done with ghost workers who are then sort of not credited with being involved in the autonomous technology. So from a labor context, it's also exacerbating inequality, especially since complex AI technology is being developed by private companies who have this financial interest in sharing the, the technology, not sharing it widely unless you're a paying customer. There's a very real scenario that could be coming up where if AI training becomes the norm in some discipline, if it becomes the case that you really need to be interacting with these networks in order to be getting ahead, only those with access will be able to uh, develop and achieve at a high level. So compared to go back to a sport, I actually think this is, I'll talk about this, I think this is even like more concerning in the science case, but to go back to a sports example for one case, Compare the, the relative levels of entry needed for uh, becoming a professional baseball player and a professional motorsport racer. Um, it's not like there's no requirements on the baseball end, but basically you just need a ball and a stick. You don't really need, uh, like soccer is an even better example of this. You just need a ball, you don't even need a goal. Just kick it up against the wall, that sort of thing. You can get started. If you wanna become a professional motorsports racer, you need a family who can afford to buy an, a car that isn't used for transportation. It's just used for you racing it, basically. It's a significant, and, and I mean, in fact, you need to be able to then travel around the world. It's, it's a significantly higher intake cost in order to become doing that achievement 
as opposed to becoming a professional baseball player. And the worry is that many things that we consider valuable human achievements are already more like motorsport racing and less like soccer or baseball than we'd like to admit. And there are plausible mechanisms why this would become worse in the near term with the advent of AI technologies. So many of the um, achievements we've been discussing, for instance, like producing scientific knowledge are already more motorsports like than we'd like to admit. And there's a particular worry here, which has to do with the way that people sort of sometimes think about the pipeline for getting people into high achieving areas like science or uh, the humanities uh, university structures more broadly, for instance, for the achievement of developing knowledge which is that it's not really the case in, in societies like ours that you can like spend as long as you want getting yourself up to the baseline that you need to get to in order to like get to the next level of your profession, like undergraduate, grad school, whatever. I'm a postdoc. You know, if I don't get a tenure track job in the next couple of years, I'm gonna have to go find something else to do to make money, right? Like people are gonna stop hiring me for like this similar string of postdocs. I really don't have an infinite amount of time in which I can try to get myself up to a tenure track level similar sort of for people who have to, you know, decide to apply to grad school a couple of times, then drop out. So um, because achievements are hard, they require a lot of societal infrastructure and resources in order to develop those kinds of talents. And if AI is gonna push things towards those who have access to it are gonna be more able to make it over the hurdle at each step of the pipeline than those of us who don't have access to it, it will create this kind of very near and in some cases already happening future where access to these technologies is going to allow people to get over those hurdles and do great things. Maybe even to go back to my argument from section three, maybe even better than what we're currently doing now. But the, but the vast majority of people are going to be just displaced in that way. You know, the bad news is that this threatens much achievement value and it wastes talent and nothing should make the perfectionist more angry than wasting a human talent. But the good news is that that's not intrinsic, so we can change it, although probably, you know, in the streets, not in the seminar room, but uh, that's the ideas. So that's what I've been thinking so far. I'm really interested to hear some, some questions, how people thought about these different fields, what I've missed, everything. Thank you. All right. Eventually, AI will do your talk. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it'll probably do it a lot better than I did. So, in that sense, in that sense, I'm like, I'm welcoming our robot overlords. <laughs> Yeah, but that's going to be quite a lot of my in Hong Kong. They don't know this, they're going to wrap it in a hair, so I try to use that as a hair of all sorts of stuff. It's just little pictures. Maybe hair, maybe hair. And even more confusing is what's called a jackrabbit in the US. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. And then there's the infamous Texas jackalope. 
Is that real? Is that real? I don't think that's real. It's as real as it Right. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad I understand now. Right. I'm... But you can buy postcards of Jackalikes. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, make me a uh, make me an offer then, right? Like the connection between banks and pens that are chained down is so ingrained. Yeah, right. Yeah, you and you have access to me uh, whenever you want, right? Yeah, exactly. You've already distanced yourself fully from the talk, so you know. <laughs> yes. Well, I just wonder this is your achievement. He's, right. <laughs> Whatever relative achievement it might be, it's it's mine, if nothing else, right? Yeah. You're not standing on my shoulder. Right. <laughs> if someone had a question on that side, let me make sure. Oh, yeah, you had a question? Yeah. Right, so let's, uh, if you have a question online, please put your name in the uh, Q&A box or in the chat box and we'll try to be with you if you have, uh, if we have time. We're not going to use the mic uh, because of the issues of passing the mask around, uh, the, the, the mic around. <laughs> passing the mask. No, sorry. Sorry. Pass the mask <laughs> around. Uh, it's no one wants my mask. Uh, uh, but we're not going to pass the mic around. Uh, so apologies for the people online. It's probably uh, very well. I'll try to just summarize what people say into the mic. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, good point. Oh, good. I'm first. Wow. Thanks. So that was, <laughs> so that was really interesting. Um, I, I found it interesting to, to hear some discussion of a theory of human achievement, which I didn't even know we had a theory of, of human achievement. So uh, thanks for introducing us to, the, to this topic. Um, I'm a little unclear what, it, what exactly is at stake, whether we're talking about whether or not um, Zido is, is, is Zido is, is right to feel that, that, his, that, that his achievement has been devalued right. by this, but, but, or whether it's whether AI is more generally a threat to humans. But what, so but I'm intrigued by the idea that achievement has to do with, um, that part of the, of, of the idea of an achievement is, is that there's a product involved, right? Yeah. Because it seems like yeah. um, it's questionable whether there's a product in, uh, in a playing in, you know, becoming a Go champion. It's questionable whether there's a product in climbing Mount Everest, right? right? Um, but then it occurs to me that maybe for sale, the product is the beauty of the individual game, the individual game token. Yep. And then in that case, if the, if the AI can play Superior games and more beautiful games, then there's no point in doing Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is um, first of all, the one part of the question is are we like trying to figure out whether or not it makes sense for Lee Sedol to be sad, or are we looking at sort of a more broad uh, question about the interaction between human achievement and artificial intelligence? I was kind of using the Sedol thing as a hook to get us into the broader discussion. I mean, at the end of the day, I think people are allowed to quit their jobs for whatever reason. And I'm not trying to like critique whether or not Seydal had good reason. I was more trying to like pick out a, a pattern of response that his sort of falls under and examine that broader pattern. The second question is what, it, what about the product in some of these achievements? What's the product in uh, climbing Mount Everest and what's the product in playing the Go games? And how does that interact with what, what, what we're talking about? So I do think that on the way that like so these theorists of achievement are working on it, I do think that there is supposed to be a product in every case. So in climbing Mount Everest, the ultimate product is, I mean, you can kind of do it both ways. I mean, I could imagine somebody saying the process was the training that you did to get to Mount Everest right before. And then the product is the, the whole climb not just getting to the top, but the product is like the, the person sort of getting from the bottom to the top, that's the product. Or the more flat-footed example that I went with, which is just like the end product is a human being standing at a certain elevation 
on the top of a mountain, right? Like that's the, that's the end product. And that's what motivates people to say things like, well, it's not merely the value of the product that matters for achievement because standing on the mountain, who gives a crap, right? It's really, it's really about the, the whole process that culminates with that. It matters in some sense, because if you weren't standing on top of a mountain, you wouldn't have done the achievement, but it itself has very little value. Now to the particular question of whether, so I actually agree that like, here's one account you could give of the achievement of playing Go. The process is all the training and all of the refinement of the rational capacity to play Go. And the product is particular games of Go either where you win and that has very practical benefits for you or you play aesthetically and strategically pleasing games and i find i find both of those things plausible what i what i'm struggling with more is why it would be the case that the fact that an algorithm could create something that was even more beautiful and more strategically interesting than what i could do would necessitate thinking that what i was doing was not beautiful and strategically interesting right um, that, that that last sort of inference that there's some all or nothing thing where, and this is this was the critique of the greatest of all time reading. There's some all or nothing thing where whoever gets to the to the end point first is the only one who's done something of value. Strikes me as misguided. It's the same. Not to throw Jason Stanley's Twitter account under the bus, but you know, one time he was like talking about how the only thing he cares about in sports is who runs the absolute fastest in the world. That's the only real achievement in sports, nothing else matters. That's a weird view. That's a weird account of like what value in track and field is. And I think that you would have to have a relatively similar view in order to make sense of the idea that, well, now AlphaGo can play better than Lee Seidel, so what the hell is the point, right? That's sort of more where I'm coming from there. But I do understand. Uh, yes, okay, thanks. That'd be a good point. Yeah, you're on the Okay, I'm going for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, thank you for the topic. It's really um, interesting. So, um, okay. I don't know exactly where to bring it, but the sure. kind of thing that's kind of came to mind that I wanted to kind of add to the mix sure. is this song, John Henry by Bon Jovi. Do you know that song? Uh, vaguely, yeah. Okay, so the song is about John Henry. Uh, he is a guy uh, who steps into the work of laying tracks for trains and he becomes really, really good at it. Right. Like the best. He's the goat. Um, yes. If I if I can get people to use the goat more in philosophy, I will have done my job already. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, anyway, yep. so, and he goes on being like the best at this until one day the owner of the company brings him a key to him lay tracks. Yep. Um, and now John Henry is in that crisis mode because now he has to do better with the machine. Mm -hmm. um, and so one day they set up a competition between John Henry and the machine, and it's really tight. And in the end, John Henry manages like just barely to beat the machine. The next day he dies because he will regret it. So thinking about this um, app talked about this this game we see about what the all um insane and I, I i think when i met his mind he thinks harder yeah and do john henry story except that for some reason i'm like well you know if it's an achievement to be like the best as a human right so then i'm finding myself asking you know what is the difference between being you know um beaten by technology when it's like ai or not like i mean you had one you had an example of that in the slide yes like you could you could you could be like a sprinter, even though a car, you yep, know, right. can go faster. And then I'm wondering, you know, like, what is the difference? Like, sure, some people think that AI one day will, you know, go be like general AI. I guess I'm not enough from yeah. you know, like, yeah. Just see about that. Well, that yep. seems to be the kind of worry that says all about. That's right. And then I'm kind of going in my mind to like, could it be the case that we're just not used to AI because it's so new? Yep. You know, and like in a while, you know, just like I do like, Thinking of this John Henry story, was like, right. well, of course the machine is going to be him. Um, maybe it's just a matter of time of like getting used to the technology. Which I think the achievement <laughs> question is so interesting, but it's just like interesting to me why people seem to be especially bothered when it comes to AI. Yeah, this is so. This is it hits on a lot of so the the basic point for the Zoom viewers was that there's the Bob Dylan song about John Henry laying tracks. 
and he just barely beats out the machine. He's also very good at laying tracks. And then he dies the next day because he overexerted himself. Um, you know, also very interesting. That one comes up in a very particular capitalist context that some theorists would be very quick to criticize in ways that maybe doesn't happen, although I've been arguing that it has. Anyway, that's the case. The idea, the suggestion being made was a couple of things, one of which would be that maybe we're just not used to AI. So once it sort of integrates into our lives, we'll no longer view it as a threat. And also that there seems to be something about AI. And I actually think that there's there's a, the, a thicket of something that I did try to say in the slides, but you know went pretty quickly through, that's sort of hitting on where I'm coming from on thinking about these issues as well, which is that um, there does seem to be a difference between I mean, I guess in theory, like the philosophers, you could make any comparison class whatsoever. I'm the greatest of all time of giving a talk in this time slot in this world. Like, you know, no one else has done it in this room. So I'm, I'm the greatest of all time. That's another way of sort of like devaluing those kinds of judgments. But I do, I do agree that there is a slightly different reaction that you have when you think about the John Henry case, because it's like in the past and it's, with regards to, I mean, here's one answer to the question of like, what's different about AI that some people have suggested. The machine and John Henry case is a case of practical action um, or a case of like physical abilities. And no human being has ever really, I mean, some maybe have, but like, it's not really part of our makeup of what we think of as being exceptional to human beings that we have like exceptional physical prowess, right? Um, we know, we know that like literally just other animals could maul us to death. Like it's not, that's, that's not going to be um, something that we, but we do think, and maybe this is what's worrisome about AI. We do think of ourselves as cognitively superior to all the other entities that we've encountered so far. And that like, maybe those, ra I mean, you know, for a while only human beings are rational. Like maybe now some other animals are too, but like still if rationality is a ranking, human beings are going to come out on top. Oh no, here's this thing that might be able to, especially in its general version, might be able to sort of unseat us from that as well. That's sort of the cognitive rather than the action oriented thing is something some people have, have put forward as saying like, it's somehow more deeply tied to our, our sort of sense of selves as human beings. And that, that that's gonna be a harder thing to overcome though on the model that you're sort of proposing, it is something to just be overcome really rather than something to lament. And I think that that, the overcoming narrative I have to think more about, but I find myself intuitively finding that kind of plausible. So I'll need to figure out a way to integrate that into the type of stuff that I'm already saying. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I struggle conceptually with the talk quite a lot. Perhaps the reason is that we have rather different views on normativity, but we discuss value, discuss achievements, and discuss achievement value and valuable achievements. Um, now, it seems to me one could have an account of achievements and what makes something a greater or lesser achievement without saying anything about what was more or less valuable. Value could be purely subjective. You can assign value to those things however you like as an individual. It seems. So I, I guess I'm trying to get to what role is value playing? Are you assuming intrinsic value? And why uh, do you need to talk about value in order to have the account of achievement and that what's, a, what's more or less of an achievement? It just seemed to me a conception I really didn't understand. Um, the difference between value and achievement and achievement value and valuable achievement and what, what role value, you, you, you talk about value and devalue a lot as well and answers the question. I'm finding it really hard to conceptually follow. So can you try to unpack a bit? Uh, yeah, the question is roughly there's achievements and there's values and what the hell is the connection between those two? Well, essentially. Do, do you have to, yeah, you could, you could give the whole talk without achievement. I mean, I suppose I could give the whole talk without talking about achievements, but I think that it would lose a significant amount of uh, what like people are worried about. Um, because I'm thinking that the whole point of why people are talking about achievements, there, there might be, sorry, let me back up. So there just is a metaphysical picture, sort of old school conceptual analysis, analysis thing going on about like, what is an achievement? In and of itself, that project has no immediate or obvious upshot about value. You just sort of go, what are, these things are achievements, these things are not achievements what makes the difference there? And maybe when you're telling that story, maybe achievement turns out to be an irreducibly normative notion, in which case something can't be an achievement without being valuable in some sense, or at least like without value, like 
uh, set up like the, the sort of goodness fixing kind ranking, like you have to be above a certain kind of threshold of the, the kind in the kind in order to really be an achievement, otherwise it's like a proto achievement or an attempt or something like those things are possible. That's one discussion. To be totally honest, I wanted to throw that in there so we could sort of rock on to the um, sort of picture that's being developed in that literature. I don't really care about that, that question. These things are achievements. These things aren't what makes a difference. The reason I liked putting up the Bradford account is because then sort of Gwen says there's this perfectionist story about why it's valuable to pursue and successfully achieve certain things, namely for perfectionist reasons, because it might be, uh, sorry, for perfectionist reasons, because uh, it involves the refinement of rational capacities and, you know, agents refining and, and doing better on their rational capacities is something that is of intrinsic value according to perfectionists. Presumably you could, here's another account, completely different account of achievement, val uh, the, the value of achievement, be more careful, uh, that you could give. Achievements are valuable in so much as they produce valuable products. So like, why do you try to cure cancer so that you can then save people's lives? Why do you um, even for the Go case, why do you play Go to produce great games of Go that people can enjoy both while they're playing it and for their aesthetic and strategic properties? But there's nothing about the achievement itself that represents anything of value. Um, there's a whole different paper uh, that just sort of sorts through all the different ways that those, those, the metaphysics and the value theoretic conceptions can link up. I'm more interested in thinking about how they apply to this particular case. And uh, in particular, I'm more interested in sort of like the accounts of the value of achievement and how that the accounts of those values uh, sort of play into particular applied examples with the background metaphysical question just assumed for the sake of argument. We could have that discussion instead. I'm more than happy to. Uh, the, the accounts that I'm working with do assume that achievements are intrinsically valuable and furthermore that they're intrinsically valuable in virtue of their, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So we've got 10, 10 people in the room. Everyone wants to I can, I can, I can <laughs> stay as long as. Yeah. Uh, mine in your Excel. We can talk all night if you want. <laughs> Wait, okay, so, um, thank you for the talk. And I wondered if we might think about a context where there's human achievement and yeah. the sport. Sure. But we can spring it. Right. So there's no doping. You're not allowed to jump on a bike at the right. beginning of a footwork. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's all kinds of rules, but what counts as, as a proper human concept and achievement in a particular case and, and we're fine with those things. Right. Like you know, we don't give the gold medal to the person who failed the steroid test. Like we say, oh, we don't care if you're the strongest in the world, we don't. Right. 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 And I wonder if the that sort of context might um, reveal a bit about what might be going on in the AI space. Sure. Yeah. Because you know Sadalto just said, well, you know, um against humans, I'm still the best in the world. <laughs> and, you know, in, in uh, the sport case, we'd be like, yeah, that's fine. That, that counts. That's, right. that's the thing. Why is it that somehow that isn't, like, is that, are we, should we think that way or should we kind of like get at the point of human exceptionalism right. that somehow we think that but we should be the goat of all species? <laughs> Right, exactly. The goat of all species. I love it. <laughs> That's so good. No, and it's also a great question. It's a really great question. And there's a couple of moving parts that I think you could point to. So the question is essentially, in sport, we are fine with saying if you doped in a certain sort of way, you're no longer allowed to compete. Doesn't matter if by some objective measure you're stronger than any of the weightlifters, right? And we think that that's fine. Why wouldn't, why isn't, why isn't the correct response to AlphaGo to say like, okay, best human players can enter this tournament. Nobody really cares about that. In other cases, why would we care about that in this context too? And one response is just to point out the relative context variance of the greatest of all time sort of thing and really wonder whether or not that label means all that much from the perspective of like what we should be aiming for, right? Same thing that I said with, you know, the greatest talk of all time given co-located in this, this room, a similar thing, you know, greatest, you could literally just say, as you said, greatest human of all time, right? 
Um, Lee Sedol explicitly sort of views that as flimsy, but you might also view all of the other categorizations that you would make as equally flimsy. In which case the, the idea would just be like, okay, cool. We're gonna create a StarCraft league where the, the alpha star can't play against human players and beat them all. Great, go, go for it. People will still pay money. It'll still produce great games. People can reflect on all the things you might think matter happen there as well. So I, I actually think that that's just like a totally fine way to, to conceptualize these sort of things and sort of de unseats us from thinking about being the greatest in some contrast class as being the thing that we should really care about. At the same time, that probably only works, I mean, you could develop a version of it, but that probably only works in the competitive case. So I worry about extending it to the other cases because imagine, imagine a, to my mind what would be quite dystopic, but imagine a world in which, you know, uh, machine learning algorithms get so good at making scientific predictions and doing it with, you know, hundreds of variables, all of which are kind of uninterpretable to human beings, right? In that world, basically what the, the setup of science is going to be like is that you have these machines and the scientists, such as they are, either write the code or maintain the algorithm or feed it its data. And it does all the work there, right? Now, that doesn't seem to be like a comparative competitive sort of case. It just seems to be a case where what we care about is generating as much knowledge as possible. And if what we care about is generating as much knowledge as possible, it's unclear why people wouldn't just use the, the machines in those cases. It's getting us all the predictions that we want. It's getting it way better. Like if a, if a human centric lab was set up over here that consistently made pretty good, but worse predictions, everyone would continue funding the AI thing because that's what we care about. And it's because it's not, it's not really competitive or especially not, I mean, it may be competitive, but it's especially not comparative in the way that competing against other people in a tournament is comparative. And some, you might worry. I mean, some people will say, great, science is doing much better than it was before. We have more predictively accurate theories. We have, we're better able to control the world. Others might say it's been sort of devalued as like a human activity because now essentially what you do is maintain the networks that do things you don't understand that give you the predictive output, right? Outside of the comparative context, I find it a little bit harder to say that just wall it off and create the human specific science lab over there. It's harder for me to get, get myself as, as breezy and unworried as I was in the go case, right? But you know, there's a lot more you could say there as well, for sure. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was really fun. And, uh, so I'm wondering about the role of novelty sure. in, in a piece. And because, um, you know, the first one to get the better, or mm -hmm. the first person right. to create two hours in the better, or um, so could also be constrained, like the first 60 year old to break two hours. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so the uh, excellent questions. So the, the basic outline of the question is, what is the role of novelty in um, achievement? And in particular, doesn't the availability of novelty sort of offer us essentially infinite paths towards things that we might dedicate our time to, right? Like, and it's, in it's interesting to think about that. Yeah, so there was actually a really interesting 
very sort of weird paper that came out last year that was a combination of the same team that was doing the uh, uh, Alpha Zero, which is the, the network that can play Go, Chess, Shogi, all these different games. And they were using that network to sort of come up with a whole bunch of different variants of chess rules, like no castling, so the king has to stay more in the center of the board, makes the game a little bit more attacking, or you can only move a bishop like two squares instead of being able to go anywhere along the diagonal, that sort of thing. And then they passed off all of the different, you know, came up with like hundreds of different variations of chess. And then it passed off all these rule sets to like, I forget exactly who it was, but some you know, formerly grandmaster chess player. So they just had him like work through the games and provide essentially like a commentary about what it felt like to play chess with all those different varieties. And, you know, apparently, according to them, apparently short clock, no castling and moving bishop only two squares makes the, the best combination of fun and strategically novel chess. Not a chess player, I have no idea if that's true. That's what they claim in the paper. Um, but it does offer this, there is definitely something there having to do with novelty. Um, and where the idea would be like human beings are in, in there, they have a lot of ingenuity. They could come up with other things that they can do that the machines can't do, or at least lagging quite behind us. And then we can sort of go back to our, fun human centric game that we're playing better than than the, the the ai for the time being and at least in the space of games why not think that this could just go on forever right you could just keep making new games with new rules i think that that probably does work for the games case um, as a way of sort of somewhat alleviating the worries here i do wonder about the um the impact on things that might have a little bit more practical value like the the scientific achievement case um, I mean, maybe what we're just learning is that these are very different things that have very different sort of conditions on which something counts as an achievement for them. And, you know, we can come up with some of these ways of avoiding, you know, at the end of the day, people probably want to say generating scientific knowledge is a more important achievement than like playing a fun game of chess. So if the all of the different moves like the novelty or the uh, category specific move, if all of these sort of generate ways for us to feel good continuing on playing games, but are less applicable to the more like societally concerning versions of this, that might be a reason to sort of like cast off the games analysis and focus on other kinds of achievements. I, I admit that I don't have a great story to tell right now about the novelty and diversity in particular. Um, just because that's something that's the literature I'm like currently reading about what you just said sounded very plausible to me, but I'm currently sort of thinking about actually with Colin we're kind of thinking about several ways in which the stuff we've been talking about sort of intersects with the value of diversity so great, great idea. Talk to me in six months and maybe I'll have more more to say about that right. Um, so I think you've been so I think you've been addressing the kind of thing I want to ask about in the last two questions. Yeah. And the like actual work. Um, so I think one thing to my mind, I mean, I don't know if I know all of these because I just too broadly, but it does seem like one kind of thing about these innovations is focused a lot on the concept of intrinsic value and doesn't talk about the role in which like producing incremental value mm -hmm. for other people is like super important for us in terms of our sense of what it means to do something. Right. Uh, like, you know, just carpentry, right? Like, part of it is maybe making really nice things and that goes to intrinsic value and the beauty of those things. Uh, but also, part of it, like, part of why it's significant is you can, like, give it to other people and see them use or share a, a table or whatever. Yep. I think you're talking about that a little bit with the, the science stuff. So I'm, I'm wondering if this is, like, not, and I think this is getting to this question, which is, like, the real problem is, like, what if we, we, we can always, like, you know, off the, the game to do art or something, but what if we can stop being able to produce incremental value for other people or the incremental value we produce is not as right. great as um, what the AI can produce? And it's just something kind of tells me about a world of like the human achievement that's like in the game to play or something and not in, you know, kind of productive labor. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I guess the, 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 the kind of um, would be like, look, 
know, he he was still trapped and were like the only people who like, did things or like could make things. Like, right. And then all of a sudden you have automation. Um, but there's still a, a place for skill trapping, right? Yeah. Right. Um, maybe there's also this sense of like they can coexist with the AI. I don't know. I don't, yeah, so so the yeah, no, the so the question is is a good one. The question is basically there is, you know, you might you might be focusing on in this talk the sort of like intrinsic perfectionist value about realizing one's capacity, but there's also this value literally of just like doing something that's difficult that has a significant practical output. And like a lot of things we call achievements, like curing cancer would be a significant achievement. It also would help millions of people, right? And so the idea would be like, here's a version of the dystopia. I actually think you could maybe get, I, I, I was kind of getting on board as you were talking more and more because here's how I heard the dystopia. It was like, I mean, Bernard Suits would think it is just utopia. So that tells you about like the difference between utopia and dystopia, the way people think about it. He thinks you'll just all play games and make art and leave everything else to the, to the machines, right? Um, but the dystopia is sort of like, human capacities in this in this sense the capacity for rational action and rational action that makes a difference in other people's lives you might care about producing something of practical value not just for producing something of practical value but also because like you're going to then be contributing to like making a difference in people's lives with how they use that thing of practical value that's slightly different than just caring about the practical value in and of itself and you might think that like Impotence is the word that comes to mind. Where it's it's a developing towards a society where um, there's no practical reason for me to do anything. That and you know this is way far out in the future. This the, these are really highly speculative examples because we're. I mean, as a matter of fact, there aren't actually these discovery engines that work without significant human input and understanding the theory anyway. So we're nowhere near there yet. But the idea is like, look now, the only things that you're doing are sort of these frivolous games while like the machines are doing all the things of real practical value they sort of removed you from your labor in the same way that the skilled craftsman was removed from their labor with the industrial revolution and i think that that's really interesting um i certainly do think that the uh the the conceptual points that are made by the achievement people are more about they so i do think they think that practical value can contribute to the value of an achievement but they just want to say that that's not the whole value of achievement, and that's why they pull out examples like climbing Mount Everest, because they're thinking that like very obviously that is an achievement and an achievement of value, but um, it's there's nothing about the process or the product that really made anybody's lives better with the sort of maybe it made you more healthy as you were getting ready to climb up the mountain. I don't know, right? Like that's that's the only thing you can think of. So they're they're sort of thinking everyone should take for granted that sometimes complicated, difficult processes can be valuable in virtue of producing a valuable output. But they're trying to focus our attention on the fact that that's not the only value present. But I mean, it's a nice corrective to remember that we might also worry about the practical value of these kinds of things. Absolutely. That is your place. Uh, one of my uh, concerns uh, has been addressed. Thank you very much for the talk. I have, I, this is still an, uh, an outstanding issue that hasn't been addressed. Maybe it has been missed it. Um, I'm wondering about the relationship between competition and being the best as an essential driver for human achievement. So sure. The story yeah. that you, you told is that that's what pushes uh, achievement. I, I'm thinking of cases uh, in the arts. I'm not sure that what drives the concert violinist to practice and work is to be the best concert violinist ever. Um, in fact, I think it's, it's interesting in, in the case of opera that many people will say that the greatest opera singer ever wasn't even the greatest singer right. ever. Yep. Um, are you overplaying perhaps competition as the, as the singular driver? Oh, so to be, so the question is, which is a very good question, is isn't it a bit much to think that people are primarily being driven to achieve by this desire to be the greatest of all time. And that's just an unclarity on my part. I don't think that that's the primary driver of a lot of, I mean, it certainly seemed to be the case that Lee Sedol thought that the reason to play Go was to be the greatest of all time. But like two things, one, as a matter of psychological fact, 
it seems really unlikely. I mean, some co people have competitive mindsets where that seems to be their, their only goal, but a lot of very high achieving people don't have that mindset. So it was, seems like a psychologically sort of false claim that I wouldn't want to make, that being the greatest of all time is what actually drives people to be um, high achievers. Additionally, so, so that psychological question is slightly different from the sort of more normative is the wrong word, like question of whether or not it makes sense, like rational sense for me to care about that kind of thing. So even if it's not the case that everybody is driven by that sort of concern, would it make sense to try to be a high achiever because you wanted to be the greatest of all time at something? And I mean, it certainly seems like it probably would, especially if you thought there was some extra value of being the greatest of all time over and above just being really good at what you do. Like imagine, imagine the mindset, someone, I forget who told, was talking to me about this, this, like imagine the mindset of like why LeBron would keep going so hard. I mean, he's not actually doing it anymore, but like why LeBron would keep going so hard to try to prove to everybody that he's better than Michael Jordan. If you thought that there was a rationally reconstructable story about why that would make sense, it's because there's this thing, not just being a really, really great basketball player, but being the greatest basketball player of all time. And he cared about reaching that and he cared about reaching that because that was a better, like, you know, that was more of an achievement is the better way to say it. There's more of an achievement than merely being a very good basketball player. That seems to me like a rationally um, consistent set of motivations, even if as a matter of psychological fact, many, if not most people are not driven by those motivations. We need to have you know, five minutes to see if we can go with you. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, uh, all right. Uh, so I had a, I had a slightly longer question. I'll save that. I'll uh, save something kind of provocative. Sure. <laughs> and hopefully, so I really, the second exchange really caught my imagination. Um, I just had to think about it for some time. I was thinking, well, okay, why do we, um, you know, why, why do we want to enter into competition? Why do we feel challenged by them? Why do we feel defeated by them? Right. Right. That kind of thing. And it kind of strikes me that um, AI has led us into the uncanny valley far more times than, uh, than, than anything else. Can. Like, you know, plastic dolls don't do it as, as well as plastic dolls that speak and sound like people right. and so on. And I wonder whether you think that there's anything, any connection between feeling in competition with or that you know, an AI is a, a valid opponent Right. Uh, and, and this kind of issue of the uncanny valley, uh, feeling that uh, there's, there's something there which is relevantly similar to what we are, such that we can be uh, in, in, com in, in kind of competition with it in, in a more deep way than right. uh, with a trailer and chat machine. Right. So the question is whether or not. Um, Using the, using the language of the uncanny valley, essentially the question is whether or not AI is becoming more and more like us, and that's why we think that it's legitimate to try to compete against them. And like we feel threatened because like they're starting to look a little bit more like us than the the track light machine, if I understood. Yeah, so I think that that is plausibly something that's going on in in this kind of case. That was the sort of thing that I was trying to get at um, with the idea that like the cognitive capacities of AI in particular we might and i mean there actually is some empirical evidence on this i'm not just speculating from the armchair people do tend to think that the mental and cognitive capacities are more uh, essential to a human being than their bodies right and their ability to act on the world um so there is evidence that people think of these things as more tightly bound up with what it is to be human a human being and so when you start building technologies that start to approximate those cognitive capacities it's this very strange, I mean, actually, it's, maybe, does this seem right to you? It's this very strange thing, like, the, this way of interpreting the uncanny valley actually means that it's going to be, like, more fierce competition than if it was just with another human being who had the whole same suite of skills, because essentially the AI is encroaching on our territory that up until now has just been our territory. It'd be the same thing if, like, a, a super a human or super intelligent alien, one of them came down and started challenging everybody to go, right? You know, we would, we, would, we would start getting a little bit like the reaction is not only or is this a legitimate object of competition, but it is an alien legitimate object of competition that seems to threaten more than just our supremacy and go. Seems to challenge us with the idea that human beings are not special in the ways that we thought that we were special. Yeah, I mean, that seems plausible. Sorry, I'm talking too long in my responses to Edward, so. Two more minutes and three details. Ryan, go for it. What, 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 
Excellent. All right, good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Well, it seems everyone is. Everyone, everyone, they want. Surrender is a right. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this great talk. Um, I have uh, an obscure remark and uh, it's a lesson. <laughs> so, I wonder what is the ontology of achievement that you prefer, let's say. Sure. Should it be this more atomistic, let's say, ontology in which we have this achievement and that achievement, and that's exactly things uh -huh. or events or even processes, but still we can localize them? Or perhaps achievements are parts of broader and richer stories. Interesting, yeah. Let's say. yeah. And these stories, which is especially illustrative uh, uh, to look at sports, these achievements. May include losing. Right. For example, uh, losing of different kinds. Yeah. Let's say. So for example, uh, let's think of the greatest of all time, which means Muhammad Ali, of course. Uh, part of what made his fight with, I don't know, George Foreman an achievement was his whole story, yeah. including. He's being detested from his title because of the Vietnam War and so on. So, forth. Right. so if we think of achievements in, in, in this way, uh, artificial intelligence may be still some threat, but perhaps not so big. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is whether or not the, the background metaphysics or ontology of achievement should be less individualized. It should contain more. I mean, one way in which say Gwen Bradford could, could respond to that and like take that into consideration is just to say that like all of Muhammad Ali's life up to those fights was part of the process of the achievement. Like you can think of the process in a very sort of extended sense. I actually thought, but, but so that might make sense of that case but the broader question about whether or not you can atomize achievements is i think really interesting in part because i could totally see in other domains i have a lot of sympathy for kinds of holistic like you know you can't not being able to analyze the parts so i was immediately starting to think about whether or not my achievement only makes sense against a particularly very complex socio-cultural backdrop that sort of doesn't allow me to sort of specify exactly in these metaphysically distinct terms what the achievement would be outside of that backdrop right and so that's when you could bring in a whole lot of the stuff we've been talking about about the history of technology and the ways in which it's been used by people to you know impede or uh unimpede human growth there's probably examples of both right and that would sort of leave you with a less obvious judgment about the particular case of lee sedal because to a certain, I mean, almost like in a Nietzschean way, it's like still open what the actual content of that story is going to be, depending on what happens in the future that may validate or fail to validate what happened in the past with AI, right? I find that it, that uh, um, perspective very interesting, even though it's definitely not the, the, the tack that I took here, yeah. All right, I think we're going to stop for today. Let me remind you, there is no lunch cancel on Tuesday or on Friday, on Friday we're meeting at 3.30 for the ALS lecture. Uh, please, when you leave the room, if you haven't done it right, but then send your email if I don't know you, but you can make in contact Tracy, if you do. And before concluding, you don't have a nice piece of center. Oh, yes. Not useful today, but. <laughs> like that, uh, what's the country where they get swords when they defend their dissertation? Well, yeah, exactly, right? It's kind of like that. <laughs> and apologies for those of you who were not able to answer questions. I'm sure we're I'm, time now. I'm around. <laughs> you can just torture me. Go for it. you questions. Mel is technically saying she had a respiratory thing, so she's not going to be here.